Peter, the topic of inflammation is one of the hot topics in physics today. It, uh, it pervades the field from communications to uh, fundamental science. Uh, most people talking about it are physicists who are looking at the universe, uh, looking at uh, uh, quantum information systems and uh, uh, all, all different aspects of physics. You, you come at information uh, trained in physics, but as a neuroscientist and particularly from the standpoint of biology, what can biology tell us about the nature of information? Right. So I think what happened is that what we call life introduced a revolutionary form of a new form of physical, physical causation into the universe. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, um, typically under the rules of, or the laws of physics, there's a great emphasis on the amount of energy, such as conservation of the amount of energy, conservation of the amount of momentum, and so forth. Uh, and there's also an emphasis on the frequency of energy. So physics has been dominated by the concepts of amplitude and frequency of energy. Mm -hmm. But what biology introduced into the equation is it made, these physical systems made the phase of energy causal. Mm -hmm. So what is phase? Phase is the spatial or temporal set of relationships among energy. So, for example, that this would be out of phase and this would be in phase, or they could be just irrelevant to each other. There, there's no phase relationship. Now, if phase can become causal, then um, something new has been brought into the world. And I think that it began very early uh, in early cells, even pre-cell-like uh, molecules, um, things like viruses even perhaps. But you know, take, for example, a simple example of a, a receptor in a membrane. Well, a receptor in a membrane will do something, like open, if certain conditions are met. And typically, this is like a lock and key mechanism. The shape is very important. Now, if, say, let's say I have a, a 5-HT2A receptor. It binds normally uh, serotonin, but, and then it'll do something, some secondary messenger cascade inside the cell. Uh, similarly, I'll have an NMDA receptor in the cell, and then something like glutamate will come along, some other thing like glycine also has to bind, some other conditions have to be met, then the, cell, the receptor will open, and something will happen, like ions will flow in, and out of the cell. So what's, how does phase play a role there? Phase is important there because shape is a set of phase relationships in space mm -hmm. among energy, shape. Um, but what's interesting, interesting about this is that uh, only a small portion of the serotonin molecule actually binds, right? Like in, the, in a key, it doesn't matter what the rest of the key right. is. It just matters that the key bit, the important bit has the right shape. And if that's true, then the, say, the NMDA receptor opens. Well. Turns out there are all these other molecules can, that can bind to the same receptor. Um, but let's take, let's go back to the serotonin receptor, the 5-HT2A receptor. Well, serotonin can bind to it, but so can psilocin, mescaline, LSD. These are the hallucinogens, just by some freak chance of nature, or maybe evolution led to plants having these molecules. Now, neurons at a much higher level are uh, responding to phase relationships in their input. Now, in neurons are not concerned with the shape of input. They're concerned temporal. with the temporal component of input. So let's say a neuron needs to have five spikes or action potentials arrive at the same time. So essentially neurons are coincidence detectors, and that's true all the way up. Um, so now you have uh, physical systems built upon phase uh, relationships, such so that phase relationships become causal. But phase relationships are really about patterns of energy, not about amounts of energy or frequencies of energy, mm -hmm. but patterns. So what you need to have are decoders, whether a receptor or a neuron or circuits of neurons that are on the lookout for certain patterns, such as a barrage of spikes arriving at the same time. And only if those phase relationships are met, they all arrive at the same time, will this guy then fire. And that's your new definition of information that biology brought into the universe that didn't exist before. Right, so information in biology, information in the brain, is always an act of decoding. So you have a decoder, a, a, a detector or a decoder, looking for certain kinds of conditions to be met. If they're met, boom, it will then change the physical system. And you can imagine now, uh, the brain is a cascade of such uh, decoders. Decoders, they get their input, 
then triggering other decoders and so forth. So for example, what leads to face recognition? Well, you might have, you know, bar detectors early in the visual system. And then if, then this neuron will only fire if they are all lined up in a sort of a circle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that neuron will only fire if it has the pattern of an eye. And ultimately you'll have a neuron that only fires if it, there's this pattern of an eye here, this pattern of an eye here, and so forth, and a mouth here, then the neuron will fire. And you might end up with very specific cells, like a, an Oprah detector, right? You know, so the, this neuron is responsive to Oprah, uh, regardless of, you know, her, 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 uh, particular view, what clothing she's wearing and so forth, because the criteria of Oprah-ness happen to be met in the input. So information in the brain is essentially a kind of criterial satisfaction of, uh, the, the, in, the constraints that will make a neuron fire. And when this happens, Information then is not something that we artificially impose on the system and call it that, but is something more fundamental. And when it occurs, it's like something new has emerged in the universe. Well, I think it's a mistake to think of information as a kind of energy that information exerts forces. It's not information is always realized in physical events. So I'm, I'm a physicalist or, you know, uh, that's a kind of monism that argues that there's only energy changing in space and time. So information is always realized in physical events. Um, but the only way to understand uh, what is going on in the brain is to bring information into the equation. Um, let me give you an example. There are these neurons that Ichak Fried uh, and for, um, Christoph Koch and others have studied in the hipp hippocampus. Um, they're called concept neurons. And so you'll have a neuron in the hippocampus that responds uh, if a certain concept is present. But, you know, one example they stumbled upon was a Jennifer Aniston neuron. So this neuron will fire in the hippocampus if the subject reads the word Jennifer Aniston, hears her voice, sees a picture of her, could even feel the name maybe in Braille. It doesn't matter what the particular input is. What all those things have in common is Jennifer Aniston. And the only way to understand what links all of those different inputs together is to, to bring in the idea that it is Jennifer Aniston-ness that is allowing that neuron to fire. The meeting of those, the, the meeting of those informational criteria. So yeah, informational criteria are always realized in physical criteria or conditions for a neuron's firing. But it, it would be a mistake to try to rule out information and just talk about atoms hitting atoms. It's not a sufficient uh, account of uh, reality because we cannot understand what it is about the physical causal chains um, that can occur um, without bringing in the concept of inf information. So if you accept indeterminism, there's many possible physical causal chains. But only a tiny subset of those are also informational causal chains. Why did that subset of physical causal chains happen and not all those other ones? Well, because those ones uh, were ones that were allowed, that, that, um, that met the, the informational and physical criteria for a neuron's firing. 